hello welcome back to my channel it's been a minute since i put up a video but i would be remiss not to do a complete bookish wrap up by the end of this year 2021 it's been a doozy but it's actually one of my best reading years yet i every year set a goal for myself on goodreads to see how many books i can get through big caveat is that I don't think it really matters the number of books you read, it's definitely quality over quantity. So for me the number doesn't really matter, I just like using Goodreads as a way to keep track of the books that I have read, or if somebody gives me a book recommendation, I put it on my TBR list so I can get to it later, and I just find it's a very useful website. So if you're on Goodreads, feel free to follow me there. I don't really know how to use the platform fully, honestly I just use it to track everything, but I do love their yearly wrap ups. I find it's really pretty to see all of the book covers and at a glance the books that I have read. And today I'm just going to pretty quickly take you through the best books of 2021 that I read. Not all of these books were published in 2021 necessarily, some are older, I've just had them on my bookshelf to read and finally got to them this year and I was pleasantly surprised. I set a goal for myself to read 50 books but I ended up reading 52 and there are 52 weeks in a year so that felt really neat to kind of hit that mark. I definitely didn't read a book a week. There were some months where I was reading a ton and others I didn't read at all so that's just kind of the average. I ended up getting to 52 books and I would say that's because I was listening to a lot of audiobooks when I would go for walks or fold my laundry or meal prep. I use my Kobo, which is the same thing as a Kindle, at night when I crawl into bed so that the light doesn't disturb Jeff. And then my favorite, of course, are physical hardcover books. So that was how I managed to read 52 books. I surprised myself with that number because it was a very, very busy year personally, but reading is always a thing I come back to, to calm myself down, to escape, and just relax. So I'm happy that I was able to get to that. So in my wrap up of the best books of 2021 that I read, I decided to curate them into nonfiction and fiction. Um, so there are five nonfiction books and five fiction books. These are in no particular order, so I'm excited to talk about them. And then, I don't know if in this video, maybe I'll do it in a separate video, I will share with you my most anticipated reads for 2022. I'm super fired up. There's a lot of books on my TBR list. I have a few author friends who are publishing books that I'm very excited about that are releasing pretty early in Q1 of 2022. So yeah, I think I'll do that in a separate video. I will just keep this video to a wrap up of the best books that I read in 2021. We made it, I can't believe it's the end of this year. It was another doozy, another COVID pandemic year, but we did it guys. We're almost at the end. Or by the time you watch this, it'll probably be the end. So without further ado, I will stop rambling and let's start with my top five in no particular order favorite books of 2021. The first one is Vanderbilt, The Rise and Fall of an American Dynasty by Anderson Cooper and Katherine Howe. I devoured this book. I am a huge history buff. I love anything about the Gilded Age, the 19th century, and I have of course heard the Vanderbilt name, but I didn't really know the intricacies of the family history, and it truly is the rise and fall of a dynasty within the span of 100 years which for a family of this magnitude is pretty short to kind of have it crumbling down. And I really love the insider viewpoint that Anderson Cooper brings along with his ghostwriter Catherine Howe because his mother is Gloria Vanderbilt and Anderson Cooper is the great 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 grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt who went by the nickname the Commodore and he is the one that started the whole shipping and railroad empire so that at one point they were the wealthiest family in America. This book I devoured. It definitely is very history and fact heavy so if you're not a huge history buff and you prefer more of a narrative this might not be the one for you but I loved kind of getting an inside look into the Breakers which was their Gilded Age mansion in Newport, Rhode Island. It takes place mostly in 
18th, 19th century, early 20th century New York, getting to see all the lavish parties, the way they dress, the intricacies of Manhattan's elite, and learning about the different family members and the Vanderbilt history, how they relate to the Morgans, and then how Anderson Cooper views his family's legacy and how he wants to pass that on to his own son, Wyatt Cooper. So love this book, Vanderbilt, Anderson Cooper, and Katherine Howe, one of my favorite nonfiction reads of 2021. The next nonfiction book that I absolutely loved in 2021, I don't have my physical copy here because I actually lent it to my sister to read over the holidays, and it is Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. I was obsessed with this book. It was super buzzworthy, New York Times bestseller. It was Michelle Zahner's debut memoir, and it's about her life growing up Korean American in Oregon and eventually starting a band and moving to New York City. She's in a band called Japanese Breakfast, which are a pretty popular band today. And the book details her struggle with identity and grief after her mother is diagnosed with terminal cancer and how she returns to their Korean roots that at times she wanted to reject. It's beautifully written. It's really about family, food, grief, survival. I'm very relatable, very readable. I felt like I was kind of reading Michelle's diary and it definitely left me feeling very hungry. She describes so many delicious Korean dishes. But yeah, just a great nonfiction read this year. The next nonfiction book that I read and loved this year was Heavy by Kees Lehman. This book was actually published in 2018, but I had it on my TBR list and finally got to it. It's funny, by the title, Heavy, I thought it was going to be a thicker book, but it's actually quite readable, easy to get through. It is such a powerful memoir about Keese's life growing up in Jackson, Mississippi, and eventually, again, moving to New York. I seem to always be drawn to memoirs where people eventually end up in New York City. I don't know why. This book touches on some pretty heavy topics, no pun intended including complex family relationships, eating disorders, gambling, sexual assault, but at times it's almost light and humorous. He is an incredible, incredible writer. I was completely enamored and drawn into this book and I highly recommend it if you have not already picked up Heavy. Again, it was published in 2018, so you might have already gotten to it, but yeah, I really loved it. And just one underlying thing that I took from it was kind of just the power of love and really how ultimately we have to learn to love ourselves first before we can truly love other people. And that's kind of a vague, maybe cliche thing to say, but I really found I thought about that a lot while I was reading Heavy. Another nonfiction book that I absolutely loved this year was Still Writing, The Perils and Pleasures of a Creative Life by Danny Shapiro. I love Danny Shapiro, but I hadn't read this book yet and I can't believe more people don't talk about it. I mean, we talk about Stephen King's On Writing or Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird as some of the top writing craft books, but this one really should be up there. It's a really small, compact book. To be honest, I don't love the cover. I mean, I guess the cover is okay. I just find it a little bit childish and doesn't go with the insightful wisdom that's inside. So it's kind of like a memoir, a lot of personal anecdotes about Danny Shapiro's writing life. And I just found it incredibly inspiring and a very comforting read to read about another author and writer's life, her processes, what she has learned over the past 20 years as a writer and what it takes to truly live an artistic existence. Lots of advice, lots of words of wisdom in here. One of my favorite nonfiction books that I read this year and a surprising one for me. I thought it would just kind of be another writing craft book that I added onto my TBR list, but I highly, highly recommend if you haven't read this already. The next book was Stray, a memoir by Stephanie Dandler. So I was very excited to read this book. I read Sweet Bitter, which was her highly acclaimed New York Times bestselling debut novel. It was also a TV show on stars. I didn't fully love that book. I liked it. I was enamored. I always love stories, again, about New York City, and it was about the behind the scenes of the restaurant industry. So I did read it. I did enjoy it. Sweet Bitter wasn't one of my favorite books, though. But when I learned that Stephanie Dandler was coming out with a memoir, I was very intrigued and eager to get my hands on it. So I read this earlier in 2021, and I honestly loved it. I don't know if 
that's a polarizing opinion because it definitely is a little bit slow in parts and can be hard to relate. But I found Stephanie's voice really strong. I like her writing style. And it starts after the success of her first book, Sweet Bitter, where you would think she's achieved this dream. Every young writer's ambition is to publish a best-selling, New York Times best-selling book and all the acclaim that comes with it. But she finds that she is deeply depressed and unhappy. And that's how the book starts. And she actually returns to Southern California. And that leaves her questioning and looking to her past to uncover why she feels this way, what is it about her childhood, her adolescence, her troublesome trauma riddled past that has led her to feel like this in the present. So she returns to California to kind of grapple with these questions that she has of why she is the way she is and looks at her troubled parents' lives. They dealt with a lot of addiction, alcoholism, divorce, abuse, and she really doesn't want to repeat those patterns and wants to know how she can prevent that. So one word that really comes to mind when I think of this book is self-destruction and how can we prevent ourselves from self-sabotaging and self-destructing, especially when it's kind of coded into our DNA. And the book is divided into three sections. So part one is mother, part two is father, part three is monster. So as you can probably assume, the first part really talks about her relationship with her mother, the second part, her relationship with her father, and the third part, she calls this man monster and is somebody she's having an extramarital affair with. She doesn't name him by name, but really how that relationship kind of leads to her self-sabotaging and repeating old patterns that she wants to break. So I really enjoyed reading this memoir also this year. I have a bonus nonfiction book that I absolutely have to mention, and that is Behind the Red Door, how Elizabeth Arden's legacy inspired my coming of age in the beauty industry by Louise Claire Johnson, that is myself. So self-promotion is so icky, but I honestly am so proud of this book. I released Behind the Red Door in May of 2021. It's just been over six months and I couldn't be prouder to have it on shelf, to see people reading it. And I think some people hopefully are gifting it for Christmas. Just seeing people learning and uncovering the incredible legacy of Elizabeth Arden, as well as kind of nuggets of my life from the ages of 18 to 25. It's something I have worked on for over five years and the fact that it is a tangible physical book that is out in the world, it's receiving a lot of buzz, it's something I'm just so proud of. I know I keep repeating that word, but it really is how I feel. It's this huge sense of relief and accomplishment and I really love the story. I mean, I know maybe you shouldn't be saying that about your own book, but I love every single sentence, every paragraph in this book. I know every word by heart and it's a truly a labor of love. So this is one of my favorite nonfiction books of 2021. And if you've read it, I hope it was one of yours as well. If you haven't, maybe it'll be one of your most anticipated reads for 2022. Hopefully I haven't bored you too much yet. I will try to go through the fiction books that I absolutely loved in 2021 pretty quickly so that you can go on and do something else with your day instead of watching this video. But make sure you add some of these to your TBR list if you're really enjoying them. So again, these fiction books are no particular order, but the first one that I loved was Fight Night by Miriam Taos. I absolutely loved this book. It is told by a nine-year-old narrator, her name is Swiv, and she lives in Toronto with her raptors-loving grandmother, big basketball aficionado, and her pregnant mother. It's these three women, three generations, all living together, and really the themes of family and learning to fight and stand up for yourself in a tough world are kind of what this book is all about. On the back, I don't know if you can see this, but it says, you're a small thing and you must learn to fight. So it's about resilience, survival, endurance, and told with a lot of humor through the eyes of this nine-year-old narrator. Incredible fiction book if you haven't read it already. The next fiction book that I loved this year was The Push by Ashley Audrain, another Canadian Toronto-based author. Didn't do that on purpose or put these in order, just so happens to be another Toronto author. So this is a psychological thriller about a woman named Blythe, her husband Fox, 
their daughter Violet and she has a new son named Sam. It's kind of like a raw and revealing portrait of motherhood, our children, what we think about them, what they think about us and how kind of behind the picture perfect family life that we often see on Instagram or social media, there can be a lot of dark things going on behind the scenes. If you love psychological thrillers, this is a really compulsive read. The next fiction book that I loved this year was Beautiful World, Where Are You? by Sally Rooney. I think that might be on a lot of people's favorite fiction book list this year, or maybe not. It was again, kind of a polarizing read. You either loved it, or you preferred Sally Rooney's other two books, Normal People and Conversations with Friends. People have asked me how to rank them. I have a hard time ranking Sally Rooney books because at the time that I read each of them, I really immensely enjoyed that book. So I, I have a hard time pitting them against each other, but I am obsessed also with Normal People, the TV show, if you haven't seen it already. Um, but I love this book. I found it a very mature, kind of confident style of writing from her. Obviously Sally Rooney is all about characters, not necessarily plot driven novels. But yeah, I thought these characters were a lot more mature. I didn't really love the back and forth letter writing. I could see why she used that as a device to have a relationship between the two girlfriends in the novel, but I found it a little bit kind of lazy writing. I hate to say that. I loved this book though. I honestly devoured it. I would give it so many stars, so take that with a grain of salt. I, again, don't have my hard copy here because I lent it to my other sister to read over the holidays. So yeah, Sally Rooney, I just will always read everything she puts out. I love her voice. I love her style. I like that she's a little bit kind of avant-garde, a little bit sarcastic. So yeah, that was one of my favorite books this year. My next favorite fiction read of 2021 was Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen. I lent this book to my dad, so I don't have it physically here to show you, but I do own all of these books. I've just been lending them out to family members because I really enjoyed them so much. And it is a thick, hefty, 600 plus page book but there's something about it that I just kept wanting to return to. I would put on the fire, make a cup of tea, and read for hours. So I got through it pretty quickly because there was something about the way he told this story that I really was drawn into. It's told kind of in, I would say like a week or two leading up to Christmas in the early 1970s, and it's about a family in a small Midwest town. And the way Friends and writes is in third person, and you get to see through each chapter kind of inside each of the family members brains. So there's a father who's a pastor at a church and having a bit of an affair with somebody else at the church. And then it goes into his daughter's life and his two sons as well as his wife. I love seeing inside the minds of each of the family members and how they're all at a crossroads in their life, but not necessarily telling the other family members. It's a bit of a slow, kind of full narrative, big picture lens. I felt like I was watching a bit of a TV series, but it's super, super compelling. Jonathan Franzen's a master. I love reading about the 70s. I really enjoyed the time period. I'm not necessarily super religious, so those aspects of it I could have taken or left behind, but it did go with kind of this family. I could picture it. I could picture that time period of the family going to church, being involved in a church group, and it does add something. So whether you're religious or not, don't get too kind of bogged down with that part of it. I really just enjoyed the character stories. And I do believe it is supposed to be a trilogy. I don't know if that's true or not for sure, so take that with a grain of salt, but this might be the first book of a trilogy and you go through different decades, so started with the 70s. Apparently it was also on Obama's favorite list this year, so definitely one to pick up, but it is a hefty, big boy of a read. And the last book that I really enjoyed, I listened to on audiobook, and it was The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. So my sister read this for her book club and she didn't really enjoy it with the physical copy of the book. She found it kind of repetitive, but when I listened to it on audiobook, I was obsessed. I wanted to go for a walk just to listen to it. And I think that's because Carrie Mulligan is the narrator. Carrie Mulligan's an actress. She's married to, I think, the lead singer of Mumford and & Sons. And she has such a soothing, beautiful voice that I really transported me into the novel. And with all of the heavy kind of books that I like to read, I wanted something fun and light. 
and this one did just that for me. It's about this girl who kind of gets caught in limbo in this midnight library. So she has this big book of regrets and she gets to try on different paths that she could have taken in her life to see which one makes her the happiest. And yeah, it's just a really enjoyable read. Makes you think about all of the different choices we make in our life and where we could have ended up. I don't want to give away too much of the book, but really it made me think a lot about the little things that we take for granted and how ultimately we are responsible for our own happiness. We are 100% responsible for the choices that we make and for the little daily joys that we experience is all within our own control. So yeah, I really enjoyed that read, but if you can, try to get it from your local library on audiobook. It also likely is on Audible with Carrie Mulligan as the narrator. Completely different experience, I'm told, than reading it as a physical book. But I loved it, likely because I did listen to it as an audiobook. Those are the 10 fiction and non-fiction books that I loved this year. They were what I would say were my best books of 2021. A few other honorable mentions, Emily Ratajkowski's My Body. It's a small little book. I again devoured it. New York Times bestseller. I thought she did a great job at marketing this book, so much so that I was eager to pick it up and read it. And I did find that I lost the relatability aspect of her points a few times. Like she makes great points, but I feel like other writers and thinkers have been there before her and she wasn't really adding anything new to it. That being said, I did love reading about her experience. She's an interesting person and she definitely deserves to be taken seriously. I can tell that she really wants to be a writer and an author. But yeah, it's a quick little read if you haven't read it already. I am curious to see what her next book is like, if she can kind of keep this going as she hopes to. So yeah, if you haven't read it already, definitely kind of worth picking up things to mull over wasn't one of my favorite books of the year but I enjoyed it. And then another book that I did enjoy but didn't make my like kind of top 10 roundup was Animal by Lisa Tadeo. I loved Three Women by Lisa Tadeo but I read it last year, two years ago now. Time has no concept in the land of COVID so I can't quite remember but I love her as a writer. Again she's one of those authors that I kind of like to follow and see what she comes out with. I enjoyed this book. It's a little bit interesting and kind of depressing but it's definitely a unique portrait of a woman in California and kind of this monster animal that lives within us all and how it gets unleashed through different parts of our life. So again another book that I enjoyed I thought it was a little bit overhyped in the media when it came out for what it ended up being. That being said again I enjoyed it just wasn't one of my top 10. All right, I hope you enjoyed that roundup. I'm gonna do my best to get this out by the end of the year, if not the first week of 2022, because I am heading to Halifax over the holidays and I'm gonna to try to just kind of tune out, go offline. So I don't know how much editing I'm gonna to get to, but I'm trying to film all of these videos before I go. But definitely stay tuned for some more vlogs, my most anticipated reads of 2022 a plan with me, goal setting, how I organize my planner, how I do my Kanban board for again setting goals and achieving them for the next year. I love starting new year fresh and also kind of a look back a year in review how I reflect before I move forward. So I have a few videos in the works that should be coming out again before the end of the year or if not the first week of January when I get a chance to edit and schedule all of these. So if I don't see you before then, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, Merry everything, and I will see you in the new year. Bye guys.